Tenakato Katoa, I am Rebecca Wright, no my, and welcome to News Hub Nation's Auckland mayoral debate. We are at the business end now of the campaign. There are just seven days to go until voting closes. So with me this morning are the two leading candidates, Sefeso Collins, welcome, Kilda. and Wayne Brown, welcome to you too. It has been a long and challenging mm -hmm. campaign. Um, we are going to start today with an issue that really got Aucklanders going when we hit the streets this week. It's crime. So take a listen to what voters had to say. You know, taking your kids out to the shops, next minute you've got someone smashing and grabbing something and running out to the shop. That's not the Auckland I know, way. Eh? I got chased by someone um, about three weeks ago um, uh, who tried to get my bag off my shoulder and I ran all the way to work to get away from him. What's your plan? What, what do you intend to do? Uh, how to, how you're going to protect people and businesses from, from that? Well, if so, Aucklanders feel unsafe. What will you do as mayor to try and make our city safer? Well, with a number of things that we've got to do. We've got to work with business associations and local retailers because they've been violated. And so you can increase the number of community wardens, Māori and Pacific wardens. We did it when I was chair of the Ōtara Papa Toi Toi local board. But we've also got to advocate to the Crown to do better up front. We know that we can take preventative measures. We can work with MSD, get more youth workers, social, work social workers and community constables so that we've got a whole of community approach. That's the only way we're going to make people feel safe and we will end the ram raids. Uh, Wayne, we have just seen footage of a brazen ram raid at St Luke's Mall. What will you do to try and bring down crime in the city? Well, it's mainly a government issue, but there are a lot of things you can do locally. In Otahu, where I'm on the Business Association, we spend about 40% of our um, ratepayer-funded money for, for the Business Association on security patrols, and that has made a fair bit of a difference. Um, and we've also tidied the street up so the street numbers everywhere all the way down on the, on the shop fronts so that people know where you are when something happens because if you just say in front of Joe's takeaway, nobody knows where to go. Mm. So there's some practical steps you can... And I'll encourage the other business associations to m make use of what's worked in some places. Nevertheless, um, I think it behoves the Mayor to make use of the powers, which we... The Auckland Mayor has greater powers than have ever been used by the two incumbents, previous incumbents. And they do have the power to pull the um, minister, the relevant ministers, police, social uh, development and justice into the office here and say, look, you've got to do better. This is not good enough. And, um, and I, I don't traipse to Wellington. They're going to have to traipse to me. Um, is it a realistic way, I suppose, to um, use private security to try and, I suppose, outsource the problem of solving crime in the city? Well, that's what we're doing in Otahu. How much does it uh, cost? How much would it cost ratepayers? Well, uh, Right. Business associations get funded by a direct uh, rate on commercial property owners, and I'm one of those. And so I thought, well, where's this going? And had a look. And um, it's quite a significant sum of money. It comes in every year, and we put 40% of that aside for security. Um, that's probably not ideal. It'd be great to have a country where you didn't have to do that, but it is a sensible use of those funds, and it has made a significant difference. We have much lower rates of crime there or shop and, and good retail sales. Queen Street, unfortunately, hasn't done that mm. and it needs to really gear it up because it's, Queen Street's become unsafe. Yes. It's disappointing. If so, um, it, what, in terms of um, crime, is that an area that a mayor can have an impact? Will you commit to bringing crime down in the city? Yeah, yeah, and that's a, a major commitment. Look, I've been on your show before on News Hub late and talked to you about how in order for us to go hard on crime, we have to go hard on poverty, and that means we've got to have a community-wide response to this. Mm -hmm. I think the key here is working with many of the Indian, Māori and Pacific wardens that we've got, because this isn't just giving it off and contracting it out to private security. This is getting the community involved, and we know from all of the data that that has a huge impact on young people. We also know that a lot of these young people people come from really broken homes and that's why it's important we advocate to the Crown to say this is where the money should go. I made it very clear to the Police Commissioner that you need more community constables because they're like youth workers, they understand young people, they know the communities really well and that's how you're going to make people feel safe. They'll be up and down the beat uh, on the streets but they'll also be identifying the families that need support right up front. So you're talking about attacking the drivers of crime there, is that something Wayne that you also believe in? Well, I do, but also the, <clears throat> there's no sanction for the younger people when they're caught. I mean, they so what go, would you do? 
Well, I think it's time that we had... Uh, we, uh, and again, mayors don't pass rules about justice. But I think we've gone a bit too far. The, they're, all, they're all young and they're all well aware of the rules and they're all well aware that you've got to get in and do it before you're 18 because at 18 you become an adult and a justice thing and then so they then move into distribution instead of straight theft. I think we've got to be a bit hard-nosed about that. There is no sanction. I mean, we're catching some of these people two or three so, times a so day and they go do? to youth what aid. Would, what would you advocate for in terms of well, a sanction? Be, well, youth aid might have to be changed to youth punishment, I think. And what kind of punishment? Well, I, I, that's for the government to decide. You know, I'm not going to clamber into that. I'm not a right, right-wing radical and that stuff. But I'm happy with what we have managed to do with what we've got in Otahu, and I will try and spread that across the district because some of the... Um, just spending your money, or your, your business association money on promotion doesn't work if you haven't got an area that's safe. Mm. And also a lot of the, uh, the, the shop strip malls don't have street numbers and they do look a bit grubby and scruffy and it's mm. time to tighten them up. If you keep things clean and tidy, behaviour improves. The, the broken windows approach, no broken windows. Yeah, like and cross out the... Um, uh, the uh, graffiti, okay, so you fact. disagree? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a, a very shallow approach. What we know from the research that Professor Ian Lambie has uh, given is that we can identify these young people, and so we've got to back it up more. Yeah, the mayor's role is to advocate. This is what's going to work. I sit down with the county's Manuko Police District commander every couple of months, and we talk to them about how we're going to approach this. This is how we do it. But we've got to have up front, we've got to be able to fund local boards so that they can share that money with business associations. We've got to support them and making sure the business associations can get the money for the bollards that the government's made available. So we can do this together, but we need a community-wide response. And I don't think just making sanctions harder, punishment harder, that is not the answer. It's never worked. You can't have a logical answer to an illogical issue. Mm. And these are young people who come from tough backgrounds. You've got to get to them first and make sure that they respect the community, the property, and the people that they're dealing with. What we have here is broken young people who are treating society in a very broken way. Way. So a key difference there between your approaches. I want to turn to housing now. It's another important issue for Aucklanders. Efeso, you have spoken during this campaign about this uh, 40,000 so-called ghost houses. They are houses that are sitting empty. Can you tell me specifically what you want to do with those homes? Yeah, I want Eke Pānuku, which is the regeneration arm of Auckland Council and our housing unit from within council, to try and reach out, to reach out to these homeowners and invite them to consider working with community housing providers and getting those houses onto the rental market. We know that in overseas jurisdictions like in Toronto and Melbourne, they're, push, they're already advocate, or they have in place uh, ghost houses taxes. I'm not going that far, but mm. what we've got here is a way in which we can talk to homeowners and say, rather than just have them there as an asset that's going to make you money when you sell it off in five years' time, let's actually take some social community responsibility because we're an evolving city. We're, 40, we're about 30,000 houses short, according to the Salvation Army. This is a way in which we build a bridge. This isn't forcing people into anything, but saying here's a way we can address the homelessness issue and the shortage of rental accommodation that we have in the city. And how many houses do you think that you might get out of those 40,000? Because people can do what they want with yeah. their homes, can't Absolutely. they? You can't force them to rent yeah. uh, to community housing providers. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not going in to force them. I'm going in to work with people so that they can identify and see the challenge we have with the housing shortage we have in Auckland at the moment. Yeah. As a sharing society, acknowledging that we're going to be 2.4 million people in the next 20 years, I think people want to show a level of community spirit mm. and they'll be one to the idea. So even if we got just 10,000 houses, a quarter of those numbers that come from Stats New Zealand, we're on our way to doing something serious about the housing shortage. Well, Wayne, you have an idea, which is to um, turn over the 40% of uh, business uh, commercial properties in the city that are currently sitting empty uh, to apartments. Tell me about that. Well, as a result of uh, um, COVID, people have learned to, to work at home, and I don't think CBDs around the world are ever going to be as full as they were. And we have currently a 40% occupancy in... Um, Offices and the the, the um, infrastructure is already there. The streets and the roads and the power and the telecommunications and the sewer and the water is in the what servicing about those things like schools and supermarkets and parks. The supermarkets are there. And the schools um, they, they they can if they're not there they can be added to that. But basically it's a big project we're talking now, isn't it? Well, it's all there. All it requires is some fairly um, 
fresh thinking in the town council planners to make it a bit easier for those that, to be converted. That's an asset, and those people do want an income from it, whereas people with their own houses maybe don't. I mean, it's a bit like a, they're like batches. You can't tell people to rent their batches to, to anybody. They'll know about that market there, and they've chosen not to go into it, whereas the people who own office buildings want people in them. Just quickly, um, very briefly here, because I'm going to move on, but um, how soon would you like to have that, uh, those uh, bu uh, commercial buildings uh, made into apartments? Well, again, you can't force them, really, but I think th those people were looking for returns pretty quickly, and if, they, if the councils manage to um, adopt a more positive, fresh approach to, um, from the planning point of view, I think that would happen quite quickly. Within three years? Oh, I expect to do it. We only get three okay. years at a time, so, yeah, of course. <laughs> OK, good, good. OK, now I've got a question quickly for both of you before we are going to go to the break. Um, it has been a tough campaign for you both. That is clear to see from all of the debates that I have watched. Uh, and tensions are running high now a week out from the uh, voting closing. So I wanted to ask you each for something that you respect and admire about the other candidate. Wayne, I'll start with you. Well, I've, we've become quite friendly, actually. I think we've had more of a problem with the other candidates than, the, um, than each other. So and what I, what I like about um, FISA, and, and it sort of reflects myself, is that we both give our messages the same, this, depending, and doesn't vary according to the audience, because both of us be, have been an audience, some of the audiences have been mm. more friendly to I, one or other of us, mm. and we've carried on with the same thing, whereas some of the other ones have tried to... Um, given guess what the audience want to hear and offer that. Mm. But Afiso stuck to his knitting, and that's been good. And, and we have enjoyed a camaraderie, which is quite surprising, really. But uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll have a few beers together <laughs> after this in the future, regardless, really. And that's been quite nice. But uh, I well, doubt whether we'd say that against about one or two of the other ones. Well, that is yeah. nice to hear. Afiso, your turn. What do you respect and admire about Wayne? Yeah, I've really enjoyed uh, Wayne's straight bat approach. He hasn't changed his message. I actually agree. Very similar views that he's held of me. And that it's been a really honest campaign from both of us. We've played with a straight bat. We've had a few jokes in the background. And I've said to Wayne, look, regardless of the result next Saturday, I might pop over to the bar that he'll be at and listen to him play the banjo. I'm not sure that I'll be any good <laughs> on the guitar, Wayne. But that's I think that's what this mayoralty has been about. We've got to play honestly. We've got to present a vision to Aucklanders. Mm. And I think we've gone about that in a way that's been honest, it's been robust, and it hasn't taken people down. This is not about pulling people down, but about pre presenting your vision. I've really enjoyed uh, being with Wayne on this campaign yeah, tour. That's true. Yeah. Well, that is lovely to hear. A nice note uh, to finish this part of the debate on. Plenty of debate still to come, though, plus our political panel to dissect it all. Stay with us. We will be back after the break.
Oi happy mai. Welcome back to our News Hub Nation Auckland mayoral debate special. With me, the two leading candidates, Efeso Collins and Wayne Brown. Now, uh, one of the biggest issues facing Auckland City when we spoke to voters was transport and infrastructure. So here is uh, what voters had to say when we took to the streets this week. It's non-appealing, as well as like slowing the traffic. Why are those road wrecks still there? Why is this road congested? The money spent not not achieve nothing. Well, Wayne, I'm going to start with you. You hate those road cones, that downtown construction. What will you do about it when you become mayor? Well, I think first thing is the contractors have been told to, will be told to drastically reduce their street presence and possibly pay for it. Because, in fact, they invade the space without care or cost and they take up way more than they need. If you look over the fences in Albert Street... Um, there's utes parked, um, more cone storage, uh, staff lavatories, lunchrooms, offices. All that should be somewhere else. They should just be having the space that they need to run a concrete truck in and out there and so that the people, the businesses there can get some customers back. But that's not just in Albert Street. That's yeah. right across, even in Ponsonby Road yesterday, you couldn't walk down the footpath because they'd taken an area the size of the stadium for a guy digging a hole in the middle. Um, and they parked the utes in there. So it's that, frustrating. It's really people. annoying. And yeah. on top of that, everything is taking too long and costing too much. And I mean, I'm an infrastructure engineer. I build and own infrastructure. And I just don't wonder why I can do it so much cheaper and quicker than the council can. And, and it's mainly just, just too many cooks spoiling the broth in there. And, th and that is your promise to and voters. Too much influence from Wellington about telling us which ones we're going to do. That's wrong as well. Well, Fesso, you want to make transport free. Wayne, you want to put transponders uh, on the buses. These two ideas have now been well traversed throughout this campaign. <laughs> I've heard that before from you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I'm hoping for is another idea about how you can attack transport for Aucklanders. It is a really going concern. Fesso, I will start with you. Yeah, just a reminder too that Fair Free Public Transport puts $27 back into people's pockets. Um, pockets, which is going to address the uh, climate change, sorry, the cost of living crisis mm -hmm. that we have at the moment, and get people out of their cars, because we've got to decongest in that short video before you came to this segment, the woman who said that the, it's just too congested, that's how we're going to get people out of their cars, good for the climate. The other thing I've been thinking about a lot of is the second harbour crossing, and we've got to bring that forward. It was brought forward under the current ATAP, which was planned for 2048, now around 2036. We've got to get people uh, from the shore or back to the shore uh, with ease. And you know, I also support the um, a trial of a cycling lane over the Harbour Bridge because we've got to look at all forms of transport, all modes, and I think that's going to make a real difference. And one other one quickly is a rapid transit network through to the northwest because we know that we've got a good motorway out there, but we've got to get people through that part quicker because the link on from Lincoln Road is just too busy. Wayne, I know uh, that you don't like the um, cycling path across the Harbour Bridge. Well, I don't like it. I just think it's a better idea. If you just put a small cycle ferry across underneath, it goes from flat ground to flat ground, um, and it's way cheaper. But if you wanted some fresh ideas, I think one of the things is that, that, that we don't learn what we do well and repeat it. We're just going to do other... The Northern Busway has been success. Mm -hmm. The Eastern and Western Busways should be built already but they're still dithering around trying to knock down houses to do it and make it more difficult than, and expensive than it needs to be. So get on with those simply. And uh, another thing that works quite well is at Whangaparaua Road, the dynamic lane. So you have two one way and one the other in the morning going into town and reverse that with lights. That should be on Dominion Road and a lot of roads around the district. It's been on the Harbour Bridge since I was at school. Um, and so we, we, if we just find what do we do well and do that, and then we... AT have been buying piles of cash on really dumb safety projects which don't improve safety at all. They just spend the cash. That's I, all. I do want to get to that, but if you're so you disagree. You're smiling there. Yeah, oh, I'm smiling because I think that a lot of these things are happening at the moment. It's not quite the new idea, but I think what we've got to be really careful of is that the, the ideas that we've got to go with is making sure we manage Auckland transport well. Mm. Viewers need to know they sit under a different piece of legislation. We've got to get them better connected to Auckland Council so that they're agreed with our policies and plans, which is in the legislation, Section 91. What I will do is put two voting councillors mm. back on that board because right. that'll give us greater connection. No different to how I feel about the Ports of Auckland.
Auckland, we can get a voting council on that board. And you also want to take a billion dollars out of their uh, budget for consultants, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, what I'm saying is that we can look at the cost of fares free public transport, which comes to about $236 million, and look at the consultant's budget. That's a billion dollars. I've also identified another billion dollars within transport funding, which could pay for that. So we, by reprioritising... You need that expertise, don't you? You need that expertise. Oh, this is what um, yeah. people and politicians and parties do all the time, is they go from consultants to trying to rehire people on an ongoing basis. Yeah. And it's disruptive to an organisation, yeah. isn't it? At least in the initial part. Yeah, I think what you've also identified Identified is that when we get caught up on full-time equivalents and staffing at Auckland Council, they all become the consultants. We end up paying them three times more. That's right. No difference to how you've got a person who's an inspector, and then they realise, actually, if I go outside and create my own firm, I'm going to make three times as much money. We've lost a lot of good staff, especially around housing, consenting to either Christchurch or to the private sector, because they know that by becoming a consultant, they're going to get more. And Kainga Order has taken a lot of our staff because they can pay one and a half times. So what we've got to do is focus on where our employment is, what we're going to do, making sure that whether it's noise control or consenting, we've got the right staff, mm -hmm. and that budget can be something we can move over for phase three public transport. OK, Wayne, you also have grand plans for Auckland Transport. You want to <laughs> sack the board over there. You have said in an um, Auckland Chamber of Commerce debate that boards are currently selected for weird reasons, including diversity. What did you mean by that? Call me old-fashioned, but the most important thing when you're on a board is is a capability and knowledge of the industry that you're put in charge of. You can have competence, though, and diversity, though, can't you? Yes, but competence comes first. All we've got is diversity. There are... And what do you mean by diversity? Well, the diversity is how you... In, can be interpreted in many ways. And how An ideal board it? for the transport board would be people all for, who have knowledge in some set, different part of that sector. You might have a bus owner, you probably have a representative of the passengers uh, groups, you'd have a, a, a roading engineer, uh, someone with roading construction experience, and you'd have a person with IT experience from the transport industry so we could brain up our signals a bit more. Um, what we've got, and if they all look like middle-aged white males, that would be okay with me. It was the con I mean, I'm not suggesting if they all look, if they all look like um, like you, that would be even better. But um, I'm not sure if that's it's a not about not. it's not about that. What we've got at the moment is that diverse, and uh, they take um, diversity is, is it being entirely due to ethnicity and gender, and they're all lawyers and accountants but with no experience in the industry, and the net result of that is appalling performance. But when we live in a diverse city... We do. It isn't diversity, ethnic diversity on the boards that govern well, these Well, we cities. don't have ethnic Important. diversity on the council. I mean, where are the Chinese and Indian people on our council? They're a quarter of our population. Oh, and yeah. I've been encouraging them to be on there. And, uh, and, and so... But, uh, but, you but can't, not on the boards. But, but what we've got at the moment is we've just got accountants and lawyers as a result of that. No, and they have their place, but you, don't, you can't expect a transport company to have, to have no roading people, no bus, busing people, no representatives yeah. of the users, and no people from IT on it, and, and expect all these other things to happen. So um, if I can get those, that diversity and include the other diversity, I would jump at it. But I mean, for many years, I tried to hire a, a young female Maori roading engineer, and I couldn't find one. They didn't come out of the university. They all went and got law degrees, unfortunately. If you so. Do you believe in ethnic diversity on our boards here I, at Auckland? Look, we're an evolving society. We need diversity everywhere. And I think what Wayne is alluding to is what he's trying to get other people you employ. When it comes to governance, the role of governors is to set the strategic direction, the strategic vision for what's happening, making sure it all complies with the law, it's all complying with health and safety. We need that. You know, we want people with accessibility challenges. They need to be talking at a governance level as well. Mm. We want the whole of the city to be represented presented. And so, yeah, I welcome diversity. Now, you've had former Prime Minister and Jenny Shipley talking about how you want more women on board. Mm -hmm. So the fact is we're an evolving society. We are not stuck 20, 30 years ago. This is what Auckland looks like today. And so we need both the expertise and the diversity. You can have both. People come with both. They come with competence and diversity. So you can have it all on boards. Okay. Well, I think that's... Wayne, I'm not arguing finally. against diversity. I'm arguing in favour of competency.
But you are saying they're mutually exclusive and that at the moment boards are um, elected for weird diversity reasons. That's what we began with. That's what I'm saying. Is it yep. just the first thing? And the other thing is that there's an absence of the users on our boards. Yes, and, I understand uh, that. I'm a great fan of users and I'm not opposed to union members, workers on the boards as well. Okay. So that's real diversity. All right. OK, now I want to touch now on the campaign. It has been a tough campaign and things have begun uh, to get personal in the last sort of stages of this campaign out there. Are you both feeling the pressure? If so, are you feeling the pressure? No, I think what I've been feeling is a sense of urgency for Auckland. I'm in this because, I said right from the very beginning, I'm, I'm in this for climate resilience and evolving society and because I've got two young daughters and I want to facilitate the necessary conditions so that my daughters and that next generation can flourish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, along the way, certain words are going to be said, mm. but that's not pressure. That's just us being on the campaign and saying, look, this is the vision we're presenting to the city. If, if so you used to be socially conservative on issues like marriage equality and abortion, but now you say that you have been on a journey and you are more socially liberal. Um, how can voters be sure that that's genuine and not just for the mayoral campaign? Yeah, they can be sure because I've changed my views and I've been very apologetic to many in the rainbow community. I've talked about the transition of my own niece, who's the eldest niece in our family, and that's been part of the journey. And I think that I've been respected by people who know that this is a journey I've been on. And you, know, you don't publicise the journey, you go through it, you go through it with your family. And I think I've shown the necessary levels of humility and desire to reconcile with parts of the community that I know I hurt. And I've apologised, I continue to apologise and I want people to know that I'm in it for Auckland. I've talked about diversity mm -hmm. and it's important that I lead by showing that I'm open to everybody and their ways of living. If there's another criticism that has been levelled at your campaign, and I just want a brief answer on this, mm -hmm. is about attendance. Do you, uh, can you reassure Aucklanders in this moment as they're filling out the ballot papers that you will turn up to those council meetings as mayor. I want to reassure Aucklanders that they will get the same passion and advocacy that I gave to the represent to the people of Manuka who voted me into office spending four months fronting vaccination events. It's that passion that I will bring to this role. OK, Wayne, your age has become an issue during this campaign and your sort of interpersonal skills. Is that a sense, are those sensitive subjects for you? What was the first thing? You just... Your age. Well, that's, that's ageist. I mean, that's just as bad as having bad views on, on people whose um, sexual preferences uh, are different from yours. And so I reject that completely. And if anyone's worried about that, they want to come surfing with me tomorrow. Um, in terms of the ability to get on with people, um, <laughs> I'm surrounded by friends. Most I'm overwhelmed by the um, a number of volunteers, particularly from communities like the, in, the Indian and Chinese communities are out there big time. I mean, Maori communities, my, my friends. So my background through sports and rugby has, has been... But the best example of that is Auckland District Health Board, hmm. um, we, where, where you get a very random collection of people arrive on that there, and, and they all swung in behind me, and we tackled some very difficult issues, including fronting up to the doctors, and hmm. it all worked out pretty well. And some of those people, including Barry de Geest, is a, who's a very disabled guy who's actually on my election team. Well, well Wayne, during this campaign, so, you know, some people have called you prickly, and while News Hub was filming with you this week, uh, you made a comment about the journalist who revealed your age, Simon Wilson. I'm going to play it now. That prick Simon Wilson dug it out. You know, and I mean, he's been at me for all year long. And the first thing I do when I get to be the mayor... I'll be, they'll be gluing little pictures of him on all the urinals so everyone can pee on it. <laughs> I didn't realise that was being we, but, done, that, but, um, and, but nevertheless, he has launched into it from day one. From day one, he said I was an angry old white man, which is a pretty good description of him, actually. Um, and so... It's become personal between the two of you. Well, no, I, well, yeah. I haven't picked on him. He's picked on me. And, um, to the, and so... I can't hold, I can't uh, get over that, you know, and, and in fact it, it, it got towards the end there that every time he attacked me I got more votes. But Wayne, you've said that character is important and how you get on with people is part of the character, uh, how you manage stress and, um, and, and how you manage conflict and also how you manage criticism. These are all really important soft skills for a mayor, isn't it? And so can Aucklanders be reassured that you will be able to manage those things well, um, or will, will you attack people personally? Mayor. No, I will talk to them. Um, the current mayor refused to 
two attended a debate about the port if I was able to talk. Now, I will talk to everybody. I still, I, yesterday I was interviewed by Simon Wilson. We shook hands at the end and it went quite well, actually, because we had got to the situation where there was mutual respect. OK. So and when there is the mutual respect, but I will talk to him, Phil Goff wouldn't talk to me. That won't happen. Did you want to apologise for Simon for those comments? Oh, it was off, off the record ones, and I, I didn't expect those to be covered. But, well, yeah, they, right, I didn't I mean wanna, to be... I, wanna, I think that's an important point, because we were doing an interview, a news interview, the cameras were rolling, you were mic'd up, and that was very obvious at the time. So I think that these... Oh, well, I comments thought we, I thought in we the finished, pu- are in it doesn't public matter. interest. It oh, doesn't matter. I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to say it, and I it certainly didn't mean to do that in a way that would become public. But, um, and I'm sure he said a few things about me that he probably didn't want to have public either. And we, we finished quite well yesterday, oddly, oddly enough. So that's best. It's best not to have those sorts of views. But I have had, he has relentlessly gone after me all year long. But you can work with your critics too. Well, I can. But in fact, uh, I'm not doing this to, to make the media happy. I'm doing this to make the ratepayers happy. They are the people who I'm worried about. You know, if I've said a few media people, that's just the way it is. But, uh, but the, if ratepayers have rate can they expect will be happy Australia with what I want. Ratepayers are facing economic pressures, and I'm worried about them. Well, I want to finish now on, on a lighter note and a more uplifting note and about <laughs> your visions for the campaign. I want to start with you, Afis. So what kind of mayor will you be from Auckland, for Aucklanders? Yeah, I'll be a, a collaborative, inclusive mayor who's going to be courageous on all decisions. I was, I'm driven by climate resilience. I'm driven by our families. I've talked about my daughters and future generations. And we've got to plan for a city that's going to ensure that everybody flourishes. We've got some major challenges in front of us at the moment. We've got to courageously deal with those challenges but in the next 20 years we're going to be 2.4 million people and this is the time where we start thinking about our families. I'm talking to young people all the time saying you've got to vote. They're the future of our city. Let's make sure we're all talking, we're collaborating, we're connected together because that's what a beautiful future is going to look like. A collaborator, a connector with a beautiful future. Wayne, what kind of mayor will you be for Auckland? Well, Stuff just recently pointed out a third of Aucklanders are wanting to leave. So I want to be a mayor that makes those third of people join the rest of us and all want to be proud to be Aucklanders and proud of Auckland. And that means cleaning up the streets from construction, finishing what we've got, get control of the costs, and, um, and just making the place tidy, neat and proud to be live of and get the traffic flowing. So it's kind of a do things and fix things approach. Um, and, and in terms of urgency, which is something that I just heard him say, he's right. There is a complete lack of any urgency about finishing our big projects. Mm-hmm. A doer and a fixer, Wayne Brown. Um, Afeso Collins, thank you both so much for joining us here on the News Hub Nation mayoral debate. We know it's been a tough campaign. We wish you both the very best on October the 8th. Uh, and we will return <laughs> after the break with all of the analysis from our political panel, Simon Bridges, Dieter Deboni and Simon Wilson.
back with our panel, Auckland Business Chamber CEO Simon Bridges, NBR Senior Journalist Dieter Deboni and Senior Writer at The Herald, Simon Wilson. Kira, good morning. Welcome to all of you. Just before we get started, a quick note for our viewers. We booked Simon Wilson for this panel 10 days ago, a week before those comments by Wayne Brown. But Simon, I do want to come to you first here. You do deserve the right of reply. <laughs> that comment Wayne Brown made about you personally, yeah. what is your response to that? Um, I'm a bit shocked and, and it's disappointing, isn't it? I, I think what I want to say is that it's journalists' job to ask questions of politicians and uh, where we see things that we think deserve answers, we've got to ask them in a way that you know, we hope will get answers. I haven't been getting answers for some of the questions I've asked. They have focused on issues like uh, his role as the mayor in the far north where he was told off by the Auditor General for blurring his public and private uh, roles, uh, where his own council uh, was upset at some of the things he was doing, uh, where uh, one of his colleagues he was on record saying he reduced me to a sobbing mess. Um, so these are questions about his personal character, uh, which I think are worth asking. Um, and then there were larger questions about his... Um, Understanding of how infrastructure works in today, how to relate to government, where his only recent experience of dealing with government was over his port study, uh, where he managed to enrage everybody he needed to influence. Um, you know, questions like that, which clearly he didn't like getting, um, but it's my job to ask them. OK, so potentially a question of character. Simon Bridges, you've been around politics a very long time. You've come across a few hot mics in your time <laughs> as well. Um, That's true. What do you make so of what we just heard? don't be too judgmental. Yeah. Is, yeah. It, it, look, is that a wise comment? whether they're expecting it to be public or not, well, from someone Wayne, who's expecting to be the next mayor. I think Wayne Brown's acknowledged that it wasn't. He's uh, um, emphasised some regret. I mean, I think what you saw in the debate, which in a sense goes to the comment, is you've got a very polished performer in Efeso Collins. By the way, that's not necessarily a massive advantage, I don't think, because polish sometimes is platitudinous. You've got in Wayne Brown a rough diamond. Uh, what that means, though, I think, is a sense that um, he still gets some messages out and he will be the fixer. So very different styles for Auckland to choose from. Okay, did I guess the question is, does it speak to Wayne Brown's ability to get on with people? Because as Mayor, you are one vote. You have to bring people together. Uh, he has to work with people he doesn't agree with, doesn't he? Um, what I think it speaks to is his technical... Um, he, he's not up to the mark technically in, in the sense of understanding modern media, modern technology, um, what he needs to say, who he needs to reach out to. He is a man, it's Wayne's world, you know, and we're just lucky to live in it. Um, and I think that's what that comment reflects. I mean, most other people would realise they're being filmed, they're being mic'd. Um, you know, most people would exercise caution in so that circumstance. An, an unconventional candidate. Um, let's get to the issues now. Simon Wilson, you've been to nearly every debate and candidate yep. meeting. You attend local board meetings, ward councils. Uh, what, what kind of mayor does Auckland need right now? Um, Auckland has a, 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 the Auckland Council has uh, been engaged in a very massive exercise in the last three years in particular, uh, obviously because of COVID. Uh, COVID took $900 million out of their budget and they had to do an emergency budget to cope with that. They had to manage their debt levels, they had to cut a lot of staff, had to cut some spending, defer a whole lot more. Uh, so there is a big question now about how the city evolves out of COVID. Uh, at the same time, uh, Auckland Council and the government together have established a massive infrastructure platform uh, where there are all over the city there are things being built. Now, they're disruptive and often they could be um, less disruptive, but the big thing there is that things are being built in this city and it's terrific. We've had a major infrastructure deficit and it's now underway. And the third one is that the council has established a, a platform for climate action. Uh, there, is, there are plans in place now which are very aspirational, but they're there. There is a framework to work with. So this election now is about who is the mayor who is going to be able to develop, keep the team going to keep those things going. So the question is what comes next? And we have two very different candidates here. Wayne Brown frames this as a race between spenders and savers. Is it that simple, Dieter? Is that what we're dealing with? Um, I mean, he's putting himself across as a technocrat who's, who's going to cut agencies and um, bean count, basically. Um, personally, I think that the mayor needs to be the visionary voice of the city. Um, and too much, you know, the CEO is the one that deals with those technocratic details. Um, 
the mayor is freed up to have a vision and to look forward and to be, I think, the continuity candidate. That is correct. You know, these these big projects, they're in train for a reason and they can't just be turned around or slashed. That's just not realistic. OK, so l- let's talk about vision. Uh, we know a lot about what Wayne Brown doesn't like about Auckland. We know what he wants to stop. We know what he wants to scrap. Uh, Simon Bridges, have you seen a positive vision from the city from Wayne Brown? Oh, look, I think so. And I think it's worth just giving a bit of a perspective here. I've already said he's a rough diamond. The reality is um, he is and he has, I think, had an effective campaign. People now associate him with fixing things. And there is, I think, for a lot of Aucklanders, since there is a lot to fix. I think what's also true, while not everyone will like his style, now what you can also say is that as a generalisation, a business view would be, you know what, he does have a sense of the private sector, there's an empathy there, and he will at a level enable that. I think you contrast that with Fesso Collins, where yep, he is the centre-like guy, uh, left guy, I should say, Um, he is much more polished, Um, my colleagues here may disagree with me, but at a level in that regard, then he is the status quo candidate. There are some things he would do, but that's so that... And I think there is an appetite for fixing, for solving the big issues that Auckland has. He talks about sacking the Board of Auckland Transport, many of the council staff going to be slashed. Uh, The Mayor does have to bring the council together, and a lot of his campaign is about slagging them off. Is that approach going to work as Mayor? I think it's difficult. It's not just the Auckland um, Transport Board. He has said that he will sack every member of every uh, board that the council uh, controls. Um, And uh, I've questioned him on that just this week, and he's doubled down on it and said, yes, that is what he wants to do. Um, That feels to me, just going back to what Simon said, said that his slogan is Mr Fix It and he's been very effective with that but the question is is that approach actually going to fix anything? Uh, Is Wayne Brown looking at fixing things or uh, in the sense that they're broken or is he simply saying well we've got a whole lot of construction disruption and I don't like it? Uh, Is there much more to it than that? And and I think what uh, voters who support Wayne Brown will have to sort of go in thinking is that it's that, you know, you, you politic in poetry and you govern in prose. <laughs> that, that is actually it. It's the intentionality. You know, it, there are some problems with the CCOs. You know, there are issues in yeah. transport and he's going to get there, even if you disregard that, you know, he's not going to get $400 million from the port uh, and so on. But it, it's not really future business focused in my view. Like, he's talking about getting rid of AT. Well, every major city in the world has an economic development agency. They have facilitated the film industry, the, you know, America's Cup, all sorts of things. You need an agency like that. They might have spent a bit too much on their office fit out for Wayne Brown's liking, um, but you can't just scrap an entire agency like that. One of the other things about the council-controlled organisations like that one is that a lot of their work is in the outer parts of the city, so in Pukekohe or in Botany or in Albany. They're very active developing those town centres so that they're going to be fit for purpose in the future. They're not in the sight lines of anyone who lives and, and works in the yeah. city centre and thinks only about Auckland as being that. But, 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 but they're doing but it. There's a very work. real sense that these CCOs from a vast swathe of Aucklanders are big, they are bureaucratic and they have lost their way. And Wayne is Brown is tapping into that. OK, so it, there's a fascinating debate and there is a real diversity of choice here for the candidates. Yes. We are now, this is our last debate. We're running out of time for people to make up their minds. I just want to ask you all quickly, Dita, who's going to win? Um, I think um, Wayne Brown has a high likelihood of winning. Mm-hmm. Simon? I think he's had the most effective campaign. I'm, I'm, it would be a brave call from a political organisation to make that call, but um, I think on a low turnout, you would say that... Um, the extent that Wayne Brown is the centre-right candidate now, um, he may have an advantage. Okay, it, looks, it looks like a low turnout. That will partly be because of a whole lot of people on the centre-left who would have voted for an establishment name like Goff or Len Brown before him uh, to, uh, persuaded this time. And partly be because on the centre-right there are a lot of people who are thinking, well, I want to vote for a centre-right candidate, but is, is Wayne Brown really the kind of guy that we think should be running the city? I think it's too close to call. OK, fascinating race to come, and we'll be back with our panel shortly. If I Akine will come back for the rest of the week's politics. But first, 